Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Scarlett Johansson sues Disney over the release of the Black Widow movie. And several charges dropped against the doomsday couple. Why Lori Vallow Daybell and her husband Chad are no longer charged with destroying and concealing evidence in the deaths of her two children. Plus, a man dies 35 years after a babysitter is convicted of shaking him as a baby. Now, the babysitter is back behind bars. There, there are very few homicide cases where you can say you have something that is this well documented. And why was this mask found in Robert Durr's possession when he was arrested for the murder of his best friend? The real estate era's shocking admission. It was her or me, I had no choice. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Scarlett Johansson is suing the Walt Disney Company, claiming a breach of contract over the Black Widow movie release. Before I got this family, I made mistakes. Black Widow launched onto the big and small screens earlier this month, released simultaneously in theaters and on Disney+. But now, the Black Widow herself is claiming that cost her big bucks. One thing's for sure. I'm done running from my past. In a newly released lawsuit, attorneys for Scarlett Johansson said she had a contractual promise for the movie to be released exclusively in movie theaters for a period between 90 and 120 days. The movie's release was delayed several times due to the pandemic. In March 2021, Disney Plus announced Black Widow will also be available to subscribers for an additional $30. The complaint states the picture grossed more than $60 million on the streaming app in its first weekend alone. It goes on to question, why would Disney forego hundreds of millions of dollars in box office receipts by releasing the picture in theaters at a time when it knew then theatrical markets was weak rather than waiting a few months for the market to recover? The Walt Disney Company responded telling Law & Crime there was no merit whatsoever to the filing, saying it disregards the horrific effects of the pandemic and the movie's release enhanced her ability to earn additional compensation on top of the $20 million she's received to date. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Matthew Mangino and Terry Austin. Matthew, is Scarlett Johansson accusing Disney of pushing consumers to watch where her contract gives her less? Could that be more than just a breach of contract? Well, well it appears that it might, it, because uh, obviously they're alleging that, that Disney didn't live up to their end of the bark. But there appears to be something a little more sinister here in that, um, you know, Disney used this film to promote their... Uh, own streaming uh, uh, operation through their network. Uh, so they didn't go into the studio, uh, into the theaters with this uh, film. They decided to use uh, the streaming uh, uh, opportunities that they had that also promoted their business that generated $60 uh, million in revenue. So is there something more sinister here than just, hey, we couldn't do this, we didn't live up to the end of our bargain? Or did we intentionally, Disney intentionally, uh, go after uh, this opportunity to to raise the uh, image of their streaming uh, operation. Yeah, interesting question indeed. Terry, the first thing that came to mind was force majeure, which a lot of people who couldn't have weddings during the pandemic understand. But doesn't a pandemic kind of change the contract? Well, Brian, it might, but everything depends on the wording of the contract. These are two sophisticated parties. So theoretically, they should have had a force majeure provision in the contract. But basically what that provision says is that both parties are freed of their obligation if there is an event like a pandemic. But we know that Disney and, in fact, Scarlett Johansson, they lived up to their obligation. So she can argue that because they did do some of their obligations, they should have come back to her and renegotiated those terms so she could get some additional money as well. $50 million, if that was the amount, is a lot of money for anyone. Absolutely. Force majeure, just a fancy word for saying something unforeseeable or an act of God that comes up in a lot of contracts. We'll see how those two parties negotiate those terms. Turning now to more top legal news and a major development in the Doomsday Duo case. Prosecutors have dropped several charges against the couple. Lori Vallow and her husband, Chad Daybell, are charged with murdering Lori's two children, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. Authorities discovered their bodies buried in shallow graves on Daybell's property. The Daybells were initially charged with destroying, altering, and concealing evidence of the children's death. 
on Thursday, at the request of the prosecutors, the judge dismissed those charges without prejudice to, quote, serve the ends of justice and for the effective administration of court's business. Lori's murder case is on hold for now while she's deemed incompetent to proceed. Chad is scheduled to stand trial in November. Terry, the prosecution has until early August to declare if they'll seek the death penalty against Chad Debo. What do you think they'll do? You know, it's about 50-50, if you ask me. I think that most prosecutors these days are a bit hesitant to seek the death penalty because they know if the jury recognizes that the death penalty is part of the case, it might be hard to get 12 members to come to a consensus. The other issue with the death penalty, Brian, as we all know, is that there are multiple appeals, and so it would take years in any event to enforce. So I'm not so sure they're going to here. All right, we'll see how it plays out. Like we said, just a few weeks until that decision must be made. Matthew, how do you think the dismissal of the lower charges changes Chad's case, if at all? I, I don't really think that it, that it changes uh, his case. I mean, Brian, this case is about murder. This is a homicide. Uh, and that's where the prosecution wants to focus their attention. They don't want the jury to be distracted by any other issues, any other charges uh, that, that aren't significant here. This is a, a homicide case. It's two, the death of two children, and that's what the prosecution wants to focus their, their, um, their priority on with regard to this matter. So it could be, Matt, to kind of look at what you're saying, could this be them laser focusing on a single issue to do a better job of prosecuting? Could that be it? Yeah, I, I think that's it. I think that they, they want to focus on what's important here, and that's the homicide charges. Uh, they don't want to distract the jury. They don't want to spend time on issues that really aren't important in the grand scheme of things. They want to go after uh, Chad and Lori, uh, ultimately, uh, for murder. And that's where they want to focus their attention. All right, so let's see how that laser focus helps them as this case continues. Like we said, Chad Daybell expected to go to trial sometime in November. Lori Vallow Daybell is still anticipating to see whether or not she's found competent to proceed. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, jury selection in the Tennessee trial of a man accused of killing a cop, then lighting his body on fire. But first, why a former babysitter is now behind bars. The decades-old case now ruled a murder. Our legal analysis after the break. Welcome back. A woman is behind bars, accused of shaking a baby nearly 40 years ago. But that baby grew up and died two years ago at the age of 35. Law and Crime's Angela Levy is here with more on the death of Benjamin Dowling. Brian, prosecutors say Benjamin Dowling was just five and a half months old when he suffered a massive brain injury after being shaken. Now, decades later, his former babysitter is charged with murder. Benjamin Dowling was a beautiful baby boy in 1984. One day, his mom said she dropped him off at babysitter Terry McCurchie's home, and when she returned, something was wrong. She said in a statement she took him to the hospital where doctors determined he had been shaken. Benjamin spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. There, there are very few homicide cases where you can say you have something that is this well documented. Forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan has seen similar cases. Benjamin Dowling died in 2019. And despite Terry McCurchy having entered into a plea deal in 1985, where she served 60 days in jail on weekends after pleading no contest to attempted murder and aggravated child abuse, a Broward County grand jury has indicted McCurchy for murder. Morgan talks about the evidence prosecutors likely have. Can you imagine if this thing goes to trial, when they walk in, and Jeanette, they're going to have to use hand trucks to bring in the documents. We've got 34 years of documentation relative to this poor man's death after all of this time. The autopsy report lists Benjamin's cause of death as homicide caused by sequelae of abusive head trauma. Now, sequelae is this, <clears throat> this bizarre world that means something has happened in relation to another pathological event that occurred in the past. Benjamin's parents issued a lengthy statement. Part of it reads, we cherish our time with and memories of Benjamin, and we continue to support him through our belief 
that there should be justice for Benjamin. Now, published reports quote McCurchy as saying back at the time that this happened that Benjamin had fallen off of her couch and that she was innocent. Joseph Scott Morgan said that those kinds of injuries likely would not have been caused by a simple fall from a couch. Brian. Thanks, Angela. Let's bring back criminal defense attorney Matthew Mangino and Terry Austin. Terry, have you ever heard of a murder that took decades to complete? How can you intend to kill someone and they die 35 years from now? You know, Brian, this is a first for me, but it doesn't mean it hasn't happened before. Usually under criminal law, the requisite intent is going to exist at the time of the crime. But we have seen cases where there is an intentional assault and then there is a murder because there's a death a few days later, a few weeks later. But 35 years later is a very long time. And as we just heard, there has to be a lot of evidence that actually connects that original act to the death of the victim. So here in this case, it sounds like that evidence probably does exist. And the rationale makes sense, Brian. Now, Matthew, you have ran on the issue of a person dying years after they were injured. Can you tell us more about these types of cases? Yeah, although it sounds unusual, it, 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 it does happen. And, and about 10 years ago in Philadelphia, uh, a police officer died uh, from gunshot wounds that he received in 1966. He was paralyzed by that gunshot. The defendant was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He subsequently died in 2007. In 2010, they tried that same uh, guy, that same defendant, uh, for his murder. And actually, after uh, a jury trial, he was acquitted. Uh, so although they, they, they pressed the issue, they weren't able to convince a jury that the death uh, of the police officer was caused by that gunshot wound uh, 40 years earlier in, in 1966. Yeah, those wheel truck barrels of however Joseph Scott Morgan described it of evidence coming in, you better believe the defense attorney is gonna try to find any reasonable doubt within it. Terry, what's Terry, what's Terry, sorry, Anjanette, what's Terry McCurchy's status? <laughs> Well, right now, she um, is being held in a jail in Fort Bend County, Texas. That is where she was living at the time of her arrest earlier this month. And she has not yet been, back to, uh, been brought back to Florida by authorities to answer to these charges. We expect that to happen sometime soon, but a future court date has not yet been set. McCurchy is not contesting or fighting her return to Florida. All right, it's going to be an interesting case. That's going to be, like Joseph Scott Morgan said, so many documents when it comes to the medical examiner to examine as to whether or not this is a cause of this poor, poor young man's death. We'll make sure to bring it to you back when we get more. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a convicted bank robber turned YouTuber reflects on his 31 years behind bars. Plus, the accused killer clown is back in court. Yet another delay in the mysterious cold case. Who really murdered a Florida mother in front of her own son? Welcome back. Jury selection is now underway in the Tennessee trial of a man accused of shooting an officer and setting fire to his patrol car with the victim's body still inside. Stephen Wiggins is charged with first-degree murder, vehicular arson, and abuse of a corpse for the death of Dickinson County Sheriff's Deputy Sergeant Daniel Baker. Baker was killed back in May 2018. Investigators say Wiggins was driving a stolen vehicle, shot Baker several times, dragging Baker's body into Baker's patrol vehicle, then drove the car several miles, then set it on fire. Wiggins was arrested after a two-day manhunt. His trial has been delayed several times due to the pandemic. If convicted, Wiggins could face the death penalty. Opening statements are expected Monday. Be sure to tune in to the Law & Crime Network for gavel to gavel coverage. The trial of the so-called killer clown has been delayed again. Sheila Keen Warren is accused of dressing up like a clown, getting out of a Chrysler, and shooting and killing Marlene Warren in May 1990 in the doorway of her home. Marlene Warren was the wife of Keen Warren's current husband, Michael Warren. The case was cold for decades until DNA evidence led to the defendant's arrest in 2017. Earlier this week, the trial was delayed until March 2022. On Friday, the judge granted another delay until May of next year. She faces up to life in prison. Why would a convicted felon turn into a YouTuber? 
Raymond Reed got out of prison about two months ago and is sharing what happened that got him locked behind bars on the latest episode of Cop Tales and Cocktails. I, I actually filled out a deposit slip and uh, on the back of the deposit slip, I just wrote, empty your drawer quickly, quickly and quietly. And she looked at me, I gave her the notes, she gave me the money, I put the money in my coat pocket and I turned around and walked out. And then I got in my car, jumped back in, went to the hotel room, started counting the money, found the tracking device. Oh. And I was like, I didn't even recognize what it was till I saw the, 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 the M for Motorola. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh Lord. So I wrapped it up and uh, tried to flush it down the toilet and then the toilet backed up. <laughs> 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 that happens well, to Howard did. quite a bit too, for different reasons. But I have trouble with a woman. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, by the time I got to the hotel, like when I opened the door, because I was going to go get the maid, I opened the door, the police was there. When we come back, Robert Durst on trial for the murder of his best friend, the shocking admission the real estate heir said to the state's mystery witness that broke the case wide open. Welcome back. We're heading to California for the trial of Robert Durst, where the jury heard from the state's key witness, who says the real estate heir confessed. Robert Durst is on trial for the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman, in December 2000. Durst was arrested in 2015, and prosecutors say this latex mask, along with thousands of dollars, were found in his New Orleans hotel room. The state alleges Durst shot Berman to prevent her from coming forward about what she knew about the disappearance of Durst's first wife, Kathy, in 1982. And a mutual friend of Durst and Berman testified in 2017 that Berman revealed to him the truth about why Kathy is missing. Susan said to me specifically that Bob killed Kathy, and I said, no, he didn't. And she said, yes, he did. And we argued about that, and she said, we love both of them. Kathy's gone. We love Bob. We need to protect him. Bob killed Kathy. I said, how do you know? She said, he told me. Prosecutors then asked Shaven about a dinner he had with Durst in 2014. Durst allegedly wanted to talk about Kathy and Susan. The dinner concluded, and it was then that I... As we got up to leave, I realized that we hadn't discussed the two things that he had mentioned, Kathy and Susan. I felt kind of weird that I didn't bring it up. Uh, we walked out the door. This is hard. We walked out the door, and on the sidewalk, I said, you wanted to talk about Susan? And Bob said, I had to. It was her or me. I had no choice. And then he turned to walk away and I said, you wanted to talk about Kathy? And he just kept walking away. Nothing more was said. On cross, defense attorneys asked Shaven if he made up this alleged confession and misheard what the defendant said. No, because I said he mumbled something. But you said, I can't really put it together what it was. So you're telling uh, the prosecutors on a tape recorded or recorded conversation that you didn't know what was said. I can't really put it together what it was. Those are your words, aren't they? Yes, I don't remember that conversation, but yes. Here's the reason I'm asking you that. Did you have in mind when you met, had this conversation, what you have now claimed in court, that is that Bob mm -hmm. said it was her or me, I had no choice. Did you have it in your mind then? Oh, I knew it, yes. But you said... Yes, you, I did. You said to the uh, district attorney's office, I can't really put it together. So I that's why I did talk about it then. Matthew, what do you think of the prosecution's style of direct, and did he get what he was after with Shaven? Well, Brian, uh, you know, as we all know, um, you don't get to pick your witnesses in a case. Uh, and uh, Nick Chauvin is not 
the the best witness. Uh, unfortunately, he said that he never discussed this matter uh, with Robert Durst at one point, uh, said that he went to dinner with him, but the topic never came up, said that uh, he said something, but it was garbled and he couldn't understand it. And now he says that that, that he says it was either he, uh, her, uh, her or me that Robert Durst uh, told him that. So that's not the best witness to have, um, you know, and you have to you know, tread lightly because you have an individual who certainly has sworn his allegiance, at least at some point, to Robert Durst. And now, uh, you know, some time later is willing to say, hey, he told me it was it was me or her. Um, you know, so, so you know, this the, the jury is not going to be enamored uh, by uh, this gentleman's testimony. Yeah, to Prosecutor Lewin's uh, credit, he's seen more hostile witnesses in this case that I've seen in eight years of practicing uh, law in Brooklyn. So kudos to him for that. Terry, based on the testimony you've heard so far in this trial, do you think Shaven misunderstood Durst or even, I don't know, lied altogether about what Durst told him? Listen, I think, first of all, Matt makes some very good points here, but I completely agree and understand with what Chavin went through and why he's changing his testimony. There's no question in my mind that Durst said at the end of that dinner that it was either him or Susan. And we have Teresa saying, and that's the wife of Chavin, that at the time he told her that. And I think his hesitancy was only because he's such a close friend to Durst. So I believe him. Believe him. I think the jury will believe him as well. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what the jury believes. There's so many hostile witnesses in this case. But thank you both for joining us. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.